Hey yo, everyone! Welcome back to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. And on this episode, we're gonna be talking about anime episodes 16 through 18 and the equivalent of manga chapter 22 to circle back and cover the Gaimon side story, and then back to chapters 38 to the first couple pages of chapters 42. And so, yeah, we're gonna talk about the conclusion to the Syrup Village arc, as well as finally getting around to the Again, the Gaimon Island side story that was skipped earlier. I mentioned, I think, in episode three, and I'll also kind of give a mini review of this arc as a whole. So, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. So, the synopsis. Now we're on to the conclusion of the Syrup Village arc with the finale of the Black Cat Pirates versus Luffy and the gang. After saving the village, Usopp makes a decision to disband the Usopp pirates and set out to sea to become a brave warrior of the sea like his dad. Kaya gifts Luffy a brand new ship, the Going Merry. With that, Luffy and Zoro tell Usopp to get on board and join them. And with that, the Straw Hat Pirate Crew is officially born. And then we finally get the Gaimon side story I was referring to earlier, where we come to an island inhabited by a bunch of weird hybrid animals and a strange man named Gaimon stuck in a box protecting his treasure that he can't quite reach. So the differences. There are actually some decent differences between the anime and the manga. The sequence with the kids protecting Kaya from Jango plays out pretty differently. Most of the major beats are still there, but there are many things that are different. In the manga, it cuts straight to Jango already having caught Kaya. And trying to hypnotize her into writing the will, and it shows the kids playing possum as they make Jango believe that they were already hypnotized and asleep. And then from there, they do the sneak attack on him with the pepper, and then take the club to his nuts, and then shove a shovel up his ass, like in the anime. But the whole trip wire and the log drop was added in the anime. And then in the manga, the kids actually take a slightly more of a beating from Jango. Instead of just that one kick, and then the next difference is kind of a really small detail, but it's it's a, I guess it's a joke that I kind of missed. So at the end, we see Usopp leaving his childhood home, and setting out, and he's got this massive backpack full of all of his stuff, and he's trying to get out of his house, and he just ends up rolling down the hill. In the anime, it shows him just rolling all the way down, and but in the manga, he actually rolls down, hits the tree line, and he kind of gets up and has to repack everything. And from there, it's funny because we think, okay, he's gonna get himself together and walk down normally this time. But nope, the next time we see him on the coast is after the whole scene with the Going Mary's intro. We see him rolling down again, and it's it's just funny to see because you think, okay, he's learned his lesson, but no,、nope, he just keeps rolling. But obviously, this joke is kind of just pushed aside, or that second layer of the joke is just pushed aside for just the one joke of him just rolling all the way down. And then the last difference is obviously the entirety of the Gaimon side story didn't contain Usopp in the manga because this happened before they all arrived at Syrup Village, and clearly Usopp wasn't there. But in the anime, Usopp is now part of the crew, and so he's present for all of that. Although he doesn't really change too much, he just kind of adds a couple more reaction shots. So, getting on to the discussion of this episode now. Before we get to the serious parts of these episodes, there's this joke near the beginning that kills me every freaking time, where they're all trying to think of what to call Captain Kuro because he doesn't want to be called that anymore. And one of his、uh, henchmen was like, "Wasn't his name here something like Klaha something?" And then it jump cuts to this other guy standing in the corner of the frame. Staring blankly right at the camera, at you, the audience, while he interrupts everyone in this matter-of-fact tone with, "It's Krasan then, or Krasan then," <laughs> and he doesn't move at all once during this scene and just stares at you the whole time, and and then everybody's just on board with that and just starts yelling, "Krasan, Krasan." <laughs> the scene is just so funny the way it's it's like cut together. I mean, the director of this particular episode. Is genius with that joke because that joke is funny in the manga, 
But it's it's not nearly as highlighted because it's all one panel. And that guy that's staring blankly at you, he is staring blankly at you from the page, but he's kind of like pushed off in the back. And so that added direction of him just being front and to the right, just staring straight at you is so funny, especially with the voice actor just using that matter of fact tone. Anyways, moving on, back to the more serious portion. So with the fights picking up where we left off, Luffy starts to gain the upper hand until Kuro decides to pull out a new technique called Shakshi, which in the Netflix translation, it's called something ridiculous like out the out of the back attack. And I'm like, what? If you can't come up with a better name, just call it its Japanese name, Shakshi, which is also funnily enough, also has an absurd literal translation. It's translates it as uh, scoop death, but it still sounds infinitely better than out of the back attack. That's like translating the famous Kamehameha to something like concentration palm thrust wave. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Anyways, sorry about the little tangent, but we see Shakshi, which is an attack that uses the stealth foot or Nukeashi, but sees him moving around even faster, but only attacks randomly with no control. And this scene is always a little freaky as it goes all quiet and we see it play out from Nami's point of view to start and we just start seeing people get slashed up pretty badly with all of the Black Cat crew absolutely terrified and desperate. Something about this scene always stuck with me with how you can see the crew members in tears pleading with Kuro to stop as well as Luffy looks on at first in confusion, but then we slowly see his confusion turning to anger until we see Luffy explode and yell out, what the hell do you think your crew are? As this blatant disregard of a captain towards the lives of his crew has really struck a nerve with Luffy as we've never seen yet. And Nami, we see in complete shock at Luffy's reaction to seeing this is also another layer added onto it. I think this is one of the first epic moments of One Piece to me. There's just something real about this scene despite the absurd thing that's happening on screen. The emotions and reactions of everyone here seem so real with just how terrified and in despair the Black Cat crew is portrayed and then Luffy's yelling with how it's animated and the reading of that line by Mayumi Tanaka all feels so real and it hits you kind of by surprise because just up until that point everyone's just kind of still cheering on Kuro and then we have that Kulasan line. The emotion on display here just sucks you in and then it just explodes. I also want to discuss another point here because this is something super important to One Piece as it becomes a central theme and it's a word that has great meaning and it's used all throughout the series and that's the word Luffy uses here for crewmate when he yells at Kuro as he's slashing all of his crewmates. In Japanese, he uses the word nakama. Nakama is actually a word we don't really have a direct equivalent in English. Nakama can often be used to mean crew member or friend or comrade or groupmate, something to that effect. But it's all those things but so much more. It's got sort of an elevated significance to all of those while also wrapping all those things together. Nakama is a crew member, but it's so much more personal and has a deeper connection than just that. But then, while friend is similar, but it also doesn't really work either here, as there is this sort of more intimate inclusivity, but obviously not quite on the level of a lover or a romantic relationship. It's kind of hard to explain, but Luffy here uses Nakama talking about Kuro's men, and this theme hasn't quite developed yet, so it is jumping the shark a bit, but to Luffy, his nakama or or his crew are the most important thing to him. He values them more than his own life or even the One Piece itself, so when he sees a captain just completely disregard the lives of his crew, it pisses him off more than anything, and to see this for the first time is chills-inducing. And the anime here does an amazing job with this sequence and gets it perfect. Moving to the other conflict with Zoro and Usopp chasing Django. But before Zoro and Usopp can reach them, Green Pepper, Carrot, and Onion are trying to protect Kaya. And two points about this sequence. I find it hilarious yet accurate that kids fighting an adult much stronger than them would go for his unmentionables. (laughs) They brutalize Django's nuts and ram a shovel up his butt. 
But on a more serious note, I like their rationale for staying and protecting Kaya, even though Usopp has always taught them to run in dangerous situations. But then they mention that they see that Usopp didn't run against Kuro, and they re- come to the realization that that was a lie. And it's always interesting how Usopp lies, but his actions speak louder than words. And his true character always comes out when it comes down to it. And this, to me, always makes Usopp easily the bravest member of the of the crew. It's easy to be brave when you have this insane strength and durability of like Luffy or Zoro. But to stand up to those same opponents with normal strength and the fear, now that's true bravery in my opinion. And so back to Zoro and Usopp, which is a pairing that I really enjoy watching because their voice actors both have such amazing comedic timing and play off each other so well. Not to mention the character dynamic of the weaker member and the stronger member also creates for some really fun moments as well. I think more than anything, this highlights how Usopp will fit into the crew and what his role is as a member that can provide support from range as well as come up with creative ways to solve problems. I love the twist that we think Zoro is going to be the one to take out Django, but he's too far away to make it in time. But really, it turns out he's just there to clear away an obstruction so that Usopp can actually finish Django from long range, which makes total sense. Now, there's one more thing I want to talk about this moment, but first... I want to go back to Luffy and Kuro's combat. Kuro is still slashing away, but when he slashes Luffy, he immediately reacts and grabs Kuro and slams him to the ground. The rest of the fight is actually really short, and the way it's paced as the climax of the fight is kind of stuck at the beginning of episode 17. So it seems like the fight just ends abruptly because I think it like completes in the first five minutes. It's just like it starts and then it ends. But I love the way this fight actually ends in the manga because it's spread between two pages and on each page has the final blow from both Usopp on Django and with Luffy on Kuro. And they're both laid out the exact same way, giving equal significance to each character's victories. And I love that Usopp's victory is treated just as significantly as Luffy's because usually a character like Usopp's victory is always treated a little less than, you know, the main character, obviously. But here, the way it's drawn looks exactly the same. And not to say that the anime didn't do it well, but I think both final impacts, the Gom Gom no Kane as well as the, the whatchamacallit, the Gunpowder Star... <laughs> Or the flame star? I don't know what what is that called? The Kayakuboshi. Um, they're both not quite as impactful in in the animated or in the anime, for whatever reason. It just kind of feels a little anticlimactic. But yeah, that's the end of the both the fights. And I I do despite kind of the anticlimactic nature of how it's animated, it's still a really satisfying end. And I like this little moment at the end of Nami being there to catch Luffy as he's passing out because at this point he's taken some pretty massive slashes to his gut as well as the rest of his body. And I also really like their conversation on what it means to be a pirate. And Nami at this point, I think, is pretty much fully on board with Luffy knowing that he is different from the pirates that she's known in the past. And that while he thinks Luffy's naivety is a little, you know, misplaced still. He does, or she does recognize that Luffy is very different and and is a different pirate. And yeah, we now have officially beaten the Black Cat Pirate Crew and its captain. With the combat over, we get to the resolution portion and we get a really heartfelt scene with Usopp and the kids Green Pepper, Carrot, and Onion as Usopp announces to them that he's going out to sea to become the brave warrior of the sea he admires and... Usopp asks each of them what their dreams are and tells them to never let that ambition die and go after them with all they have. They say their goodbyes and disband the Usopp pirate crew. I love these moments. As I've always said, these emotional moments are done so well and really give the the series that attachment to the characters that is so great and it gives you something to care about. This is also where Oda starts to hammer home the theme of dreams. Each crew member has a dream And that is what pretty much drives them to go out on this adventure. We don't know Nami's yet as she isn't an official member, but one of the most important things to each character is this goal or dream each of them has, which will continue to be expanded and explored as the series goes on. 
I personally will never get tired of visiting this theme as I like to be reminded to chase dreams and go after things you want and never give up on them. And moving on, meanwhile, as Luffy and the crew are eating, Kaya finds them to offer them a gift for their help in saving her and the village. And this turns out to be a new ship, which is what they came here for. It's a Caravel model ship designed by Mary himself and aptly named the Going Mary. I love the little bit of comedy here with Mary trying to explain how the steering of the ship works to Luffy and he just stares blankly at him. And then Nami immediately recognizes and like, nope, I'll listen to everything. <laughs> also, after Kaya mentions she's had the ship loaded with all the necessary food and supplies they'll need for the journey, Luffy uses <laughs> this completely wrong saying in Japanese called uh, fundari kettari dana, which is a saying meaning you took a beating from all sides or um, like a streak of bad luck has happened. What he meant to say, as Zoro corrects him later, was it, itareri tsukuseri, <laughs> which is you went all out or there's nothing left to be desired. And <laughs> I, I love this exchange as Mayumi Tanaka's reading of this line is just so genuine and sincere as Luffy says something absolutely ridiculous and Zoro just calmly correcting him and calling him an idiot <laughs> gets a laugh out of me every freaking time. And this was actually pointed out to me, um, I forgot who, I think it was some some YouTube video. But I love that Usopp, instead of just showing up or walking up to the coast, he gets from his house to the coast in a really fun and true-to-character fashion as he just continues to roll down the hill and then gets stopped by Luffy and Zoro with their feet to his face. Another example of how Oda uses every moment to build character and keep things fresh and fun. And then we get the moment where Usopp, getting ready to leave after saying his goodbyes to Kaya, wishes Luffy and everyone luck on their adventure and that he hopes to see them again. But then Zoro's like, what are you talking about? Hurry up and get on. And Luffy following up with, aren't we already a crew? But obviously here he uses the word nakama. You know, he in Japanese he goes, mo nakama daro. It's always a really special moment when we get a new crew member. And I love this that throughout most of the conflict, Zoro and Luffy already considered Usopp part of the crew, just through his bravery and sacrifices as we've seen throughout the arc. With both Zoro and Luffy, these small reactions to many of Usopp's actions, and that they had already considered him one of them. And with that, we have our fourth and technically fifth member of the pirate crew. And yes, I am considering the Going Merry as a crew member. I mean... He, she, you know, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, is Mary is such an integral part of the crew. I'm going to put Mary here as a crew member. Of course, we'll explore more of that much, much, much later on. Of course, for those of you that have already seen the series, at least up to the NES Lobby arc, know how important Mary is. Now, before we leave Syrup Village, we get a little conversation between Kaya and Mary, and we get to see Usopp's backstory. As we find his mom had died of an illness shortly after his dad left with Shanks, but neither of them resented him, but rather are extremely proud of him. We learn his desires to go out to sea is to follow in his dad's footsteps, as well as the reason he lies to the town about pirates. It was his way of coping with the tragic loss of both of his parents as well as why Usopp is so kind towards Kaya and the kids. While this is probably the least tragic and most kind of an afterthought of the crew backstories, it still does its job in establishing why Usopp is the way he is and what motivates his actions throughout the rest of the series. And I say least tragic because, oh boy, some of these backstories, man, they are tragic. To the point where you're just a sobbing mess after you watch them. But we'll get to those when we see them. I know I didn't really do an arc wrap up for either of the first two. But seeing as how this is the first one that actually lasts a decent number of episodes. I just want to kind of review it. As I already mentioned this arc isn't the best. While I still enjoy it immensely. I do see its flaws and why some people would be turned off by this series at this point. As it is a little boring and the villain is not particularly me memorable. And the fights are not quite the action-packed sequences you'd expect from a shonen battle series to the point where some of it's pretty undercooked and very simple. 
But the reason I love it, as I've mentioned in each podcast uh, covering this arc, is the comedy, the emotional core, and the themes, as well as the character building, are all still amazing here. Like, really amazing. Because these three things, or I guess four things, are still so well done, I don't care as much about the underwhelming villain and fights, because if it was the other way around and had cool villains and amazing fights, but none of the emotion, character building, or comedy... I would have turned it off real fast here. There's also this underlying theme of pride in this arc with Usopp's whole character and his dream to become a proud warrior of the sea as well as his pride in his father despite him leaving to become a pirate is shown to be willing to give whatever it takes to maintain that pride even if it's difficult whether it's his fear or being mocked by everybody No matter how much he's mocked or looked down for his father leaving them, he still holds his own and his father's pride. Whereas Kuro, on the other hand, has completely abandoned his pride and is selling out because he couldn't handle the cost of being a pirate. He threw his name away and pride away. And I like how Luffy and Usopp together in this arc show us that in the world of One Piece, there's a right way to be a pirate and a wrong way to be a pirate. And Luffy and the Straw Hats are definitely one of the right ways to do it. And then once out to sea, the crew try to design their own Jolly Roger mark. And I'll never tire of Luffy's terrible artistic renditions throughout the series. And this is where it all starts. Honestly, when I first saw that drawing of his version of the Straw Hat Pirate flag, (laughs) I did a spit take. It's so hilariously bad, yet endearing to the point where... I also kind of want a poster of that somewhere. However, Usopp comes to the rescue and happens to be a great artist, which makes sense with his character, with how good he is with his hands and how creative he is with when it comes to his gadgets. He properly draws the mark, and we now properly introduce the Straw Hat Pirate Crew. And I don't know if you noticed that I've made a conscious effort to not call them the Straw Hats up till now because I'm a nerd like that and believe that this is the moment they truly become the Straw Hat Pirate crew. (laughs) And then finally, um, on episode 18, this is where we get the Gaimon spinoff. And this, I think, is really the only one-off episode we ever get in One Piece that doesn't really have a whole arc or much relevance the whole story or at least so we think but i always found that this episode being shifted was weird because the theme of this story ties in so well with the theme of treasure that just happened before this during the conflict with buggy in orange town i think it really is hinting that one piece the one piece is not treasure in the sense of you know gold jewels and fortune and i think it's foreshadowing that one piece may be that cliched story of how the real treasure is the friends we made along the journey while i hope it's not that simple i honestly wouldn't mind that also i don't think it is going to be that but like i said i honestly wouldn't mind if that was the treasure I like this little side story though, just for the sheer fact that I like seeing Luffy and the crew being good people and and genuinely helping out others. That little moment of fake out with Luffy seemingly unwilling to give Gaimon the treasure was a great moment even though we all know the reason he didn't was because we know Luffy is a good guy, but it still hits you with Gaimon's devastating reaction to the fact that he'd wasted 20 years of his life. But then here's again where One Piece is so amazing. With such a simple story, we get another great message here, or lesson, or theme, or whatever you want to call it, that I also still look to in my everyday life, to be honest. You know, where Luffy says that it was lucky they found him only after 20 years. Imagine if it had been 30 more, he might have been dead. And that's actually an incredible way to look at it. And it hits me pretty poignantly every time. It's like, yes, you may have wasted a huge chunk of time or failed at something, but look at all you still have, and look at all the time you still have. There may be other things of value you gained along the way, so not only was it not a waste of time, but it's also never too late to start over and go after a new goal. This is actually what gave me the confidence to, you know, completely change careers later in my adult life, despite devoting so much time and resources into my last career, because... I wanted to go after my dreams and do what I really felt is important and passionate about. And so, you know, despite having done college and worked in a field for 
close to 10 years, I actually went back to school and changed careers completely. And that quote is kind of what propelled me to do that. So yeah, with that sort of sappy story out of the way, before we end, I wanted to mention that uh, that particular joke in this episode, the pampered son or the Hakoidi Musko joke. (laughs) This is another one of those Japanese wordplay jokes. And I know you're getting probably tired of me explaining them, but I love them so much that I want to talk about them. In Japanese, a sheltered or pampered boy or son is called a hakoiri musko, which literally translates to son in a box. And obviously, it's just kind of referring to the fact that, yeah, a sheltered or pampered boy is just always protected inside of a box. And so when Luffy and Zoro see Gaimon, a man literally trapped in a box, they automatically say, oh, he's a hakoiri musko or a pampered son. And then Gaimon starts to go with it by telling some fake story about how he grew up pampered and sheltered by his parents before getting angry at the stupid joke. But he does this twice. He does it when first meeting Luffy, and then he does it again when first meeting Zoro. And this joke is hilarious, but it's kind of lost in translation because obviously we don't have that same saying, the Hakoiri Musko or the son in a box, um, that, that same saying. But I love these completely random and nonsensical jokes that are thrown in every now and then. But yeah, on that happy note, that brings us to the close of this episode with the rewatches of episodes 16 through 18. Despite its kind of shallow and simplistic story, the Syrup Village arc was still thoroughly entertaining to me, even when it, with its sort of anticlimactic end with the fight between Luffy and Kuro. I still love these episodes for how funny and interesting they are when it comes to the characters. Next episode, we've got the backstory to one of our favorite Straw Hat crew members, as well as the start to a new arc at a fancy sea restaurant. And folks, this is where One Piece starts ramping up to its eventual epicness. From here on out, the series is fucking amazing, and I cannot wait to talk about it. If you enjoyed this, send me a like or a comment, or if you have any questions, I, I don't know what I could really answer, but... If you want to join me on this journey of rewatching One Piece, please consider subscribing. I'd really appreciate that. Um, check out my Instagram and Twitter account at Sunnygo Podcast if you want updates of when I post new episodes or see some pictures of my manga collection. I've started to post um, some screen caps of the manga where they're different, all the differences. So you can check those out there. And as always, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to listen to my podcast and hope to see you on the next episode. And if you want to, you can stick around for spoilers. So just a couple things I wanted to mention with the spoiler section. Um, we see a couple more Usopp lies or stories that have come true. So in this episode, as um, or in episode 17, Usopp is reminiscing about the kids and they, they talk about their adventures chasing the Cerberus, which is the local dog, as well as the dragon, which is uh, just a lizard. And it's funny because Usopp, we obviously later go on to see him run into an actual three-headed Cerberus zombie dog on Thriller Bark uh, when they first land there. Or, um, yeah, when they first land there. And then when we get to Punk Hazard much later on, we see Usopp, Luffy, Zoro, and Robin run into this massive dragon on the fire side of Punk Hazard, which quickly gets its head cut off by Zoro in an amazing fashion. But yeah, it's cool to see that two more of Usopp's stories have already come true. And yeah, it's kind of cool to see that actually. And rewatching this, I completely forgot about this because uh, it's kind of an afterthought because they flash on screen so quickly. But the Cerberus and the dragons are also part of Usopp's lies that have become true. Another thing I always found interesting is that Kuro is still alive and Luffy just sort of lets him go and or more like just throws him away. And Kuro hasn't really made a reappearance or even really a mention of him since this encounter, whereas almost every other character has shown up at some point, somewhere. He does briefly appear um, to see that Luffy had gotten his first 30 million uh, berry bounty when he defeats Arlong, and it looks like he has become the captain of the Black Cat Pirate Cruise again, but I wonder if this is just because 
Oda being kind of uninterested in furthering this character because even he found Kuro to be a bit basic and boring and not as fun to revisit. But yeah, I do I do wonder because I think he really is the only villain that hasn't really come back. Um, you know, while Arlong hasn't necessarily come back in or in the present, you know, he's still a very big part and is mentioned when they go to the Shabondi Island, when they meet Hachi again, as well as when we get to the New World, when we get to the Fishman Island, and we see with Hodi and Jinbei and all of that backstory, we are, we know we see Arlong mentioned quite a bit during that arc as well. But Kuro and then the, obviously the next villain, Don Krieg, they don't really come up ever again, you know? I wonder... You know, I, I hope I don't really care too much about Kuro or Don Krieg, but I really want to see Ging again, and I'm gonna and I'll obviously talk more about that when we get to the Baratie arc. That's pretty much the only thing I wanted to talk about. Um, obviously we know the Going Merry won't be with us forever, and you know it is nice to see the beginning of going of the of Mary, but. It is going to be very sad when we get to that point when we all have to say goodbye to Mary. But yeah, that's kind of it. I'll hopefully see you all on the next episode.